our next speaker. Professor Thomas Gartman, hello. Hello. Thomas Gartman is a musicologist. He's head of research at the Bern Academy of the Arts and head of the doctoral program Studies in the Arts at the University of Bern and Bern Academy of the Arts. Thomas Gartman conducts research on a large variety of topics, including contemporary music, self-playing pianos, interpretation, and improvisation. Amongst many publications, Thomas Gartman has published the essay Repeatability versus Unrepeatability in Free Improvisation in the Routledge Handbook of Philosophy and Improvisation in the Arts, and the volume Rund um Beethoven, Interpretationsforschung heute, that he co-edited with Daniel Allenbach. He is also currently responsible for the SNF-funded Agora project, Magic Piano, a research project focusing on self-playing pianos. And in today's presentation, Can You Conserve Music? Thomas Gartman will indeed uh, tell us about self-playing pianos, as well as different types of music, such as classical music, improvisation, and conceptual music, as various examples to help us grasp the complex question of music conservation. Can music be preserved at all? And what is being preserved in the process? Thank you so much, Thomas. I'll leave the screen to you. Thank you very much, Emily, and thanks for inviting me. I was asked to present some remarks about music. What is the same? What is similar? What is different from visual arts? Uh, can you see? The presentation. Yes. 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 You can first enlarge all, it. You can make it all, bigger. Please. Uh, first of all, all music is ephemer ephemeral. Music is uh, music as Zeitkunst, uh, as uh, we have uh, learned from Hegel. Music uh, as an art of time. Let's have a look on three different kinds of music. Type one is traditional classical music, type B, music improvisation, and type C, conceptual music. First, the uh, traditional classical music here as an example, a Beethoven piano sonata. Here the score is the musical work the music is documented in this notation by the composer. Or not? Question mark. I will come back in a minute. Tape B, music improvisation. My example is uh, the Cologne Concerto by Keith Jarrett. Here the documentation is a recording, either as a vinyl or uh, later on compact disc is the documentation of this certain concert, the documentation of a unique performance. We are coming back. And type C, conceptual music. Here the documentation is possible thanks to written explanations. Here the composer gives us the rules of the game, the rules how to play some kind of use instructions, Gebrauchsanweisungen. My example here, John Cage's four minutes, 33 seconds, details about different versions follow. Tape one, back to tape one. What is the music work? It's a philosophical question. What is fixed in a score? Celibidache has uh, written this. Uh, what is uh, fixed uh, in a score? Everything is uh, fixed uh, in the score. Everything is written down. Only the important one is not. So 
Is it only the score as musicology pretended for a long time? Beyond the score is an important book about performance studies by Nicholas Cook. Interpretation als Kunstwerk is the title of a PhD thesis by Hermann Gojewski. And of course, for the audience is not the composer in the focus, but for example, the pianist. So we have Paulini's Beethoven, we have Brendel's Beethoven, we have Liszt by Horowitz, or even Bach transarranged by Busoni, or uh, as is written here, transcriptions for piano after Bach by Busoni. And of course, uh, the documentation of a certain interpretation we have uh, in the compact compact disc uh, in the vinyl or uh, before in the shellac. But is this uh, really the recording of an interpretation? The conductor Selvidache, he was a very famous one, uh, follower of uh, Furtwängler and successor of uh, the Karajan, for him, every recording is only sound in pancakes, onanism, substitute gratification, all fake. His arguments against the recording is an interpretation is made only for a very special moment, for a very special situation, for a very special hall and his acoustic, for a very special audience. So he was never in a studio and he almost uh, has uh, forbidden every recordings. But uh, there were many recordings, live recordings uh, of his interpretations, mostly of the issued uh, only after his death. Another extreme is Glenn Gould, the, the famous uh, pianist. He has called uh, this uh, every uh, this uh, the concert is an evil for him it was a uh, terrific uh, to play uh, before the uh, audience in front of the audience uh, so he has uh, retired from stage uh, early uh, when he was uh, only 25 uh, and he moved to the studio but here uh, he has constructed his interpretation recomposed, sound, sound manipulated, and so on. It's the construction of an interpretation. So in the history of sound recording, before the compact disc, we had the vinyl, before this, uh, the small uh, recordings at uh, the shellac, uh, 78 uh, turnings uh, in a minute. Uh, before this, uh, the phonograph, uh, and first of all, the Vex uh, cylinder uh, invented by Edison. Uh, he has uh, recorded, for example, the Pope and Enrico Caruso, and so on. And beside this, there exists uh, also another kind of recording, the Welte Mignon reproduction piano, and also uh, reproduction pianos uh, of other uh, companies, uh, well, the Minio existed from 1905 uh, to 1928. In our uh, project, uh, magic-piano.ch, uh, you can uh, see some films, videos, uh, piano rolls, recordings, uh, also essays, dialogues, uh, and so on about this very uh, special reproduction uh, tool. Here, uh, the pianist uh, had made uh, their recordings uh, they had played uh, on a special uh, piano prepared uh, with uh, 
paper roll, and in this uh, paper there were uh, holes. They have uh, recorded uh, this interpretation, and uh, these paper rolls with the holes are controlling the reproduction piano, uh, who is uh, working with uh, electric motor uh, on a pneumatic basis. And uh, the results, now you can replay on a modern uh, concert uh, piano. So the recordings made 100 years before, you can replay as if it would be uh, played uh, live. And you can also digitize uh, these uh, recordings. You can analyze this. You can also make uh, some embodiment uh, and also some reenactment uh, with them. For example, you can play to the left hand uh, of Rachmaninoff or to the right hand uh, of uh, Max Reger and so on. When you hear for the first time to this uh, piano rolls, paper rolls. I think uh, you found it uh, very funny, very crazy, because it's uh, very different from today's interpretation. And uh, you can't believe at the first moment that it's uh, really authentic. But we have uh, also other uh, sources, for example, practical editions, uh, annotations uh, of these uh, pianists. And uh, you can also compare with uh, their acoustic recordings in some cases. And so you can see these recordings are very valid, but very fascinating. Because uh, many, many uh, pianists have recorded on this. The eldest one is uh, Karl Reinecke, a pianist uh, born in 1824, uh, when uh, Beethoven and Schubert uh, were still alive. Imagine this. And uh, in 1835, he made his first uh, European tour. He was uh, admired uh, by Felix Mendelssohn, and he was prized uh, as a gracious Mozart spieler, as a player of Mozart, who is uh, played. Uh, very uh, gracioso. Later, he was piano and uh, composition professor and director of Leipzig Conservatory. So he was really an important man of the 19th century. And now, if we are uh, hearing to his uh, first uh, Recording, a uh, recording of a slow mu movement uh, of Mozart piano concerto uh, recorded in 1905. Uh, you will hear it at the moment. I think we can't hear you, Thomas. Not? Um, uh, perhaps you have to enable sound from your computer. Uh, just a moment. Oh, OK. OK. working now? Yes, yes, thank you. Excellent. Here you can hear a very special kind of playing uh, this uh, dislocation. Uh, both uh, hands are not uh, together. Uh, first, uh, you can see here uh, every time uh, the left hand uh, and the right hand uh, is later. 
and uh, every chord uh, is uh, in arpeggio, uh, like playing a harp. And later on, you can also hear how his freely improvisation uh, with uh, freely with uh, ornamentations. You can also hear uh, the famous uh, Rondo alla Turca by Mozart, uh, played on piano roll a little bit uh, later, uh, 1907, when he was uh, 83 years old, uh, still in a uh, very fit. Um, just a moment. It's really uh, very funny, very crazy, even unpredictable. And uh, most interesting is, of course, uh, if a uh, composer performer uh, has recorded. Uh, and uh, we have uh, many composers uh, that were also pianists, uh, like uh, Debussy, Greek, Reger, uh, Rachmaninoff, and so on. And they also have recorded their own works in a very free manner, uh, as we can hear uh, with uh, Debussy. He's playing his La Plucolante, uh, a slow waltz, uh, recorded before 1913. And uh, it's very hostile, very volatile, cheeky even. And I think uh, also with uh, much elegance and nonchalance, uh, he even omits uh, single notes uh, or some bars.
really very free playing. And uh, also here you can hear these uh, these locations and uh, very free agogic uh, in the tempo is very, very free in the right hand. In the left, uh, he is uh, always in time, as we have learned uh, by Chopin or before by uh, Mozart. Now let's go to the take B improvisation. There are also big questions uh, in this type. What is an improvisation? Is an improvisation repeatable? What about this paradox? What is a recorded improvisation? Which status has this? It's the documentation of the performance, not of the process. But in improvisation, the root is the goal, the big is the seal. It's very rare that the process of an improvisation is also documented. One example is a project uh, made uh, by Swiss Geo uh, Koch Schütz Studert. Uh, they have uh, hired a hall, a club uh, in the industry uh, quarter of Zurich. Uh, a club for 30 days uh, every night uh, they have played they have uh, improvised uh, and the big the huge challenge was not to repeat themselves 30 times to play but differently in a study uh, i've uh, worked about uh, this uh, paradox uh, project and it's uh, possible to see this uh, process uh, and to hear about this process thanks of the CD production. Uh, every night uh, was uh, recorded uh, and the CD was uh, a composition of on his uh, own work and artwork because uh, it's the construction. Uh, there are samples uh, of uh, different uh, concerts, of course. And uh, we have also a video, and we have uh, also the reflections of some of the musicians. And now we are going to the third one, uh, to the last one, to the conceptual music. Here my example is John Cage. Uh, what he has written down, what is uh, written in the score? In the score, we have first movement, touch it. Second movement, touch it. Third movement, touch it. In words. In earlier versions, there are more musical notations with staves, with the uh, musical staves. As you can hear, see on the left uh, with the tempo remarks. And the meters and the staves are empty, of course. And we have also a commentary by John Cage in this score. Here, one tacet, two tacet, three tacet. Note the title of this work is the total length in minutes and seconds of its performance. The first performance was at Woodstock, uh, also in the classical music. Uh, Woodstock uh, is uh, very uh, important. Uh, it was uh, in 1952. Uh, that's exactly in the middle of the life uh, of John Cage. The title was uh, four minutes, 33 seconds, and the three parts were it gives uh, the uh, duration indications of this uh, very first uh, performance. It was performed by the pianist uh, David Tudor, who indicated the beginnings of parts by closing, the endings by opening the keyboard leads. 
However, the work may be performed by any instrumentalist or combination of instrumentalists and last any length of time. And uh, when you look uh, in uh, YouTube, uh, you can see many, many different uh, versions uh, from solo versions uh, up to orchestral versions. And of course, also the audience uh, is part uh, of the game, like uh, in Michaela's uh, video. Uh, audience uh, is uh, very important here in this uh, piece uh, because uh, you can imagine when uh, four minutes uh, you have uh, on stage uh, an orchestra or some musicians and they don't play anything. So the audience will be uh, very restless. Uh, they will be uh, coughing and laughing and make noises. And of course, uh, also uh, the context uh, is part of the game. Uh, once I heard uh, a performance uh, with uh, open windows, uh, so also the nature was uh, part of this performance. And of course, uh, this concept has one problem. It's working only for the first time like uh, many other conceptual music pieces. You only can get the same impression once. I think uh, it's somehow similar uh, to a symphony of uh, Haydn called Surprise. You can't get the same surprise twice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thomas. That was so interesting. And um, I realized just how narrow my knowledge of music is whenever I hear you speak. <laughs> it's just so exhilarating to think of those parallels and simultaneous existence of uh, musical works in so many intricate layers and places. I think it resonates with a lot of Things, but the questions are already piling, so I will perhaps give the opportunity to Jules to ask your questions because you were first. Do you want to jump in? Sure. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Thomas. That was so interesting. Uh, my question is really more, I was just kind of musing, um, <laughs> you know, because we, um, in our work, we're so often thinking about recordings, we're thinking about documentation of, of any given kind of performance, and then we think about this idea of re-performance, of a kind of recreation or reenactment, uh, similar to what uh, Michaela was, was just talking about. But it seems that with the player piano, with the magic piano, the, the, the boundary between what's a recording and what's a performance, a re-performance is completely dissolved. And it's, I'm wondering if it's, you know, kind of what the implications are for for performance more more generally. If there's this medium that is that is capable of of um, kind of either, I don't know. I mean, would you say that it's that it's a, a, a recording? Would you say that it's a reenactment? Would you say that it's a third category? Uh, I think uh, it's a replay. It's a it's a uh, on the one hand, uh, the recording session is a recording session, so it's uh, really a recording, but you can't uh, get uh, all, uh, for example, uh, you can't uh, get uh, the dynamic uh, note in uh, all the wideness, uh, but uh, so it's a restricted uh, manner of uh, recording uh, 100 uh, years ago, and now uh, the replay is again some kind of recording because, uh, so we have also uh, named it uh, Magic Piano because uh, on the stage you have the piano but without the pianist. So it's uh, mm -hmm. really like a ghost uh, playing. Uh, you see uh, the keys uh, go down and up uh, but uh, without uh, any uh, pianist. So it's a uh, very uh, special uh, 
experience. But uh, on a second uh, level, uh, it makes this uh, more complicated because uh, when you are playing on an automatic uh, piano, then you can also record this. Uh, so uh, we have uh, on these uh, old uh, piano rolls, we have reenactments or recordings on uh, LP, for example, uh, from the uh, 1950s. Uh, we have uh, from uh, now, we have uh, from the 80s. And uh, it's uh, very different uh, because of uh, there are many different uh, pianos, many different uh, instruments. Uh, and so the sound uh, is very different. Uh, but uh, also uh, in the mechanical side, uh, there are some differences, for example, about uh, the tempo. So uh, not every recording of the same recording are the same. Uh, it's a paradox, uh, if you understand. And since you said that the recording, uh, the piano is playing the recording, but the pianist is not there, I was wondering, because in art conservation, we also often get the reproach that we forgot sound and other aspects of artwork, and we focus so much on the visual. So I want to reverse the question to you and ask in music conservation, what space and importance is given to the non-musical and non-oral dimensions of a music performance? It depends on the kind of music. Uh, of course, uh, in the opera, uh, the visual part uh, is uh, very, important uh, but uh, also for example in the improvisation if you see the uh, interactivity of the musicians is not only uh, an um, acoustic uh, part uh, of the game but also a visual part uh, if you see how they uh, interact uh, and also in the classical music uh, uh, perhaps uh, you know the famous uh, recording of the truth uh, quintet uh, by Jacqueline Dupré and Daniel Barnbaum and so on. Uh, here you have to see also, and it's not only to hear, uh, to get uh, all the joy and all uh, the enthusiasm of uh, these uh, five musicians. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Aga, I think. Um, sorry, the, <laughs> the chat is moving up so fast. Where was your question, Aga? Um, she was asking if in musical tradition, those recordings of composers playing their own music uh, compositions are considered as the original or the most authentic ones, or, it's, or it is an interpretation of the score equal to the others. Uh, it's equal to the others. Uh, also, if a composer is in, interpreting uh, his own works or analyzing his own works uh, in a text, so it is only one uh, interpreter of this. Uh, of course, uh, one who knows uh, his own work uh, very good, uh, but uh, there are also composers that uh, they don't remember very much uh, uh, what uh, they have uh, uh, written down. And uh, sometimes uh, it's a uh, very paradox. Uh, for example, uh, there are recordings by Bella Bartok. Uh, in the score, uh, he has written down the duration. He has uh, written down the tempo and he has recorded. And all they three together, they don't fit. Uh, there are uh, three different uh, meanings of this. So which one is authentic? Thank you. Um, I have another question by Paul Kuya. Hello, Paul. Um, I am curious about how the score serves as a kind of authoritative master against which we can even think an idea like reperformance. For example, when we hear a recording and it is noted that there is a note not being played, or the two hands are slightly syncopated, we can only think through such comparison based on a score that can be consulted. Uh, very good question. Of course, uh, there are also 
non-written traditions. Uh, there are um, some traditions, uh, for example, uh, in the Baroque time, uh, it was uh, only written down the skelet uh, of a music. And if you only play the skelet, so it's really not a skelet, uh, but all the ornamentation, all the feeling voices, uh, uh, even the bass, uh, they were uh, improvised uh, in the moment or uh, arranged uh, or rearranged. Uh, but uh, in the in the 20th century uh, half, uh, first uh, half, uh, the score was uh, like a Bible. Uh, it was uh, uh, received uh, as uh, very uh, authoritative. And uh, only after this, uh, when also these uh, old uh, traditions were more and more known, uh, so we can see that even the composers uh, themselves uh, and uh, pianists or other musicians uh, with the big uh, tradition, they were playing very free about uh, these uh, scores. So it's a, 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 a eternal struggle between uh, the different uh, parties, yes. Thanks. Um... Anna, you also had a question, I think. You can't find it anymore. Uh, do you mean me, Emily? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Let me find it. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas. It was, it was really very, very rich and, and informative. Um, I wonder, um, you know, in your opinion, whether recording uh, transforms uh, musical improvisation into something um, that we might think of as musical work. Uh, you know, I'm thinking here obviously about uh, Lydia Gers, the uh, philosoph uh, philosopher of music. Lydia Gers' view that um, around, I think, more or less uh, 1800, music started to um, kind of become canonized and presented um, outside of its performance. And do you think that a recording um, does just this, turn you know, musical performance into a musical work? I think that it might have um, potential implications for how we think about performance, uh, because you know, performance uh, kind of stemming from the visual art perspective is something that exists in many different kind of um, iterations, variants, um, improvisations perhaps um, gets turned into this kind of performance work once it gets, gets institutionalized, even conserved, although we, we want to you know, keep the notion of conservation broad, open and expanded. Um, but yes, I just wanted to, to hear your opinion on the musical part <laughs> of this question. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh... For example, the Cologne uh, Concerto, uh, this recording is a frozen version of uh, this uh, very special concert, but uh, it's an uh, iconic one. Uh, one million uh, have uh, listened uh, to this, uh, and uh, it's uh, also uh, good uh, for teaching improvisation. So it's really like uh, a musical work. Then, my example of this uh, Korschütz Studisch, uh, 30 nights uh, at the same club. Uh, the CD is based uh, on this uh, 30 nights. It's normally a uh, CD is a, a documented form of the sonic uh, res result. Here is a montage, is a post-production, with post-production techniques. Uh, so it's transferred into a new artwork sui generis. Uh, it's an artifact uh, with uh, work status. And of course, uh, the next uh, medium, uh, the video, thanks uh, to the radical editing with uh, only short uh, sequences and excerpts of the process. Uh, so we have uh, also the process. Uh, it's not a uh, uh, musical work, but an audiovisual work, a new one, I think, together also with the statements uh, of the three musicians, of course. They are also part uh, of this new audiovisual work. 
Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Um, I see many comments by Alex in the chat, and I think he or she, I don't know, is asking about um, the technological bias in recording techniques and specifically the Veltaminium recording technique implying specific artifacts that, that can lie about the exact original interpretation. But I'm not sure if it's a question for you or if it's part of a discussion. Um, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, if you compare with uh, acoustic recordings, so it seems uh, that they are rather valid, but uh, there are many, many questions, uh, of course, about uh, tempo. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the other parameters uh, are rather clear. And you even can uh, record uh, the pedal marks. Uh, so you can hear uh, the pedals. Uh, it's uh, very seldom because uh, in the uh, acoustic uh, recordings uh, of this time, 100 years ago, you can't uh, hear uh, any pedals, mostly. OK, thank you so much. Are there any other questions? Did we take the one from Tatiana Cole? Um, oh, I, sorry. You know, sometimes I just like you and I. Yeah. <laughs> things disappearing. All right. I didn't see it. Sorry, Tatiana. Uh, what would you say is the value of the music critique um, in the overall documentation and conservation of music? The importance of the music critic. Critic, yes. Uh, is very important, especially for this time we haven't any recordings. For example, uh, from the 18th century, we only have uh, critics uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, letters uh, of musicians uh, when Mozart uh, has. Uh, written to his father. So he's uh, also some kind uh, of critic. Uh, so it's uh, very important. Uh, in the time when we have uh, recordings, uh, that's uh, from uh, 1889 onwards, uh, so it's one of uh, the sources uh, we have. And so it depends uh, of the ears of the critic, of course. If it's a good critic with good ears, so it's uh, more important uh, than uh, for another uh, who is uh, only polemic. But uh, of course, uh, as in every text, uh, what uh, A is uh, writing about something sometimes is more uh, writing about A himself, but uh, about uh, the Thanks. And if I must, may I ask one last question. Um, what is also the role of the, the audience um, documentation of music? Because now with everybody recording everything, there's less and less um, separation between official and unofficial, and those recordings are circulating um, very fast and everywhere. I was wondering what the impact. Uh, sometimes it's very interesting to hear uh, to the reaction of uh, the audience. For example, we have a uh, project uh, about uh, live recordings, uh, forbidden recordings uh, uh, of uh, Metropolitan Opera. And here you can see uh, how were uh, the reactions of the audience, uh, sometimes uh, also some critical remarks uh, because uh, it was uh, recorded uh, in the audience. Uh, so we can hear uh, the remarks uh, of uh, some of the listeners. And uh, of course, uh, the reaction of the audience uh, are also stimulating the musicians. And so you can also get uh, the interaction between stage uh, and audience. Fascinating. 
Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, I think we have to move on because we have a live performance coming up. So I will pass the word to Hannah, who will introduce the performance. Thank you so much.